Please give a warm welcome to Omar Fast. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> those of us that have been following your career um, uh, figured that eventually you'd get around to making a film. Um, you were, were you aware of the book um, and attracted to making it into a film or, or I had the sense that the, 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 a number of different converging forces led to you making this film rather than you buying the book, reading it and saying, I'm going to make a film. I was uh, trying to cross the street in London, a busy street, and the book fell on top of my head and uh, nearly knocked me out. Um, now, it, it really, I mean, looking, I mean, retrospectively, obviously, it, it might make sense, but it didn't make any sense at all at the time, and um, to me, it still doesn't. I mean, um, I read the book on the advice of Gideon Lewis Krauss, who was uh, here or there yesterday, so... Uh, he's probably not here today, and he's a, a writer and a friend, and he recommended this book for a number of reasons, because my work is, uh, shares a lot of the issues that, um, that the book is uh, involved with. And so um, I read the book, and I got in touch with Tom, and uh, I really just wanted to, I knew that he had worked with artists, and I thought that we could do something together loosely based on the book, uh, but within the art world. And then he said, no, 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 no. Um, the rights have been bought. It's a really big project, and um, you know, uh, go home, young man. So, um, so I did, and a few months later, the uh, the rights were somehow magically given up, and uh, the big project that would have been uh, was not. And so, I, I inherited the mess and uh, try to clean it up a little bit. Is there are there any is there any residue of um, the big project in terms of uh, ways in which it, it it diverges from the book that remain in this film? Um, I mean, we we actually didn't use the script that they were originally uh, created, so we did uh, start uh, from scratch. And Tom and I met in Stockholm, and we um, sort of um, stared at the floor, stared at the wall. It was a very empty space. He had a residency. Um, you know, we spilled some coffee on the floor and then let it just dry and kind of looked at that. Uh, we were just getting to know each other, and so um, we spent a lovely weekend doing that um, kind of stuff. And then we, we made a, a map on the wall which um, kind of compresses the book into, into a diagram. And if you're familiar with this uh, lovely New York, well, Brooklyn artist, uh, Mark Lombardi, it's kind of this really uh, intense schematic diagram that was kind of the size of that screen over there. And then I had to stuff it into a suitcase on Ryanair on my flight back and um, sort of unfold it in my studio in Berlin and try to make sense of it. So it started uh, very much as a kind of uh, a visual sort of uh, analog or a visual model to, to the book. And then we ended up uh, filling up uh, quite a bit of the uh, missing parts. And I'm not, I don't come from uh, cinema and I don't come from, uh, you know, this kind of independent uh, feature filmmaking. Um, and so the whole process was very much uh, collaborative in, in a way that I'm not familiar with. So there's a lot of input and a lot of sort of uh, pressure to create something that may have been akin to what they were previously involved with. But um, um, some of it's there and some of it has sort of been left out. Um, one of the things that's that's very striking in terms of divergence, perhaps, between uh, the book and the film is the book is very much in the first person. It's deeply interiorized. Everything is happening from the point of view of the unnamed protagonist. Um, you sort of almost hint that it's going to go that way by beginning with a voiceover, th then you throw the voiceover away um, until the very end when it comes back. Uh, and so I'm interested in how you went about translating um, something that was very interiorized into something that was externalized. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you read the book and you, um, you actually cut out the, um, um, the dialogue, the lines that he exchanges with other characters in the book, you might have something that's two or three pages long. And so, uh, uh, but he's a chatterbox. He's constantly, constantly yapping at you and you're literally sort of sucked into his head and forced to inhabit it and to live in this, uh, uh, you know, extremely weird but very normal person uh, who sort of goes about things in his own way. Um, 
and it was a very early decision to uh, not make a voiceover driven movie, although we had quite a few attempts and whatnot, and I think the voiceover that's left behind is a kind of an attempt given the structure, the kind of cyclical structure to, to sort of, in a way, just give the, the protagonist uh, a little bit of a, of a stage, a little bit of a soapbox to stand on in order to declare a purpose and declare a vision so that uh, right at the beginning you have a sense of place and a sense of voice and at the end you have that repetition but the text is of course a little bit um, uh, altered and if you've watched the whole film and haven't fallen asleep uh, somewhere along the way uh, you know that you know you know what the character has been through you know what he's done and so the idea is that the, the, the kind of the, the little change th this notion of repetition and change that's so inherent to the book and uh, to this film project sort of makes sense given this very brief voiceover that we have. But obviously the central conceit of, of reenactment is, is, you know, in your wheelhouse, as they say. The wheelhouse. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but the, the, the actual end result is that I find the film much more enigmatic than the book. The book pretty, is pretty clear in, in what it's doing because you're, in, you're inhabiting the mind of the character and, and you're following that logic. But the film, um, by, by removing that, becomes a much more mysterious and enigmatic experience. Um, and I particularly was curious about, the. there are many additions, many changes, many more than I realized uh, until I, uh, I watched it again. The one that I'm particularly curious about is the addition of the, of the boy, who appears very early and then fleetingly is glimpsed throughout the film and then finally emerges fully I I during, the re during the actual bank robbery. I'm interested in, in your um, introduction of that device and what, what your intention was there. Well, I, I would just like to sort of preface that by saying that what, what, I, what I'm really interested in my, in, in my work in the kind of short films that I make within the uh, sort of the art uh, context and also I think in, in, in maybe in the, the better way uh, for this project is really the symptoms. I'm not interested so much in the uh, explanation. I'm not interested in the backstory, as it were, and this was quite a bit of a, a struggle uh, during uh, development and during um, uh, making this project. How much do you actually, you know, how much of the hand do you reveal, and and what makes this character, in their words and their terms, sort of sympathetic, um, and in my sort of understanding, uh, uninteresting. Um, hmm. I wanted to have somebody who has a mask on, and it was literally looking in the mirror. Uh, as he does in the film, and he, and he sees something, and he sees a kind of an altered presence, he sees this kind of blank presence, and he tries to fill it in, uh, this, uh, this emptiness, I mean, the, the, the kind of the gap that's caused after the trauma, and we know that what a trauma is, is a kind of uh, a disruption, a, a literal sort of rupture in the kind of, in a, in a person's normal sort of everyday sense, and a uh, temporal sense, um, and what I was interested in is creating a, a person who's not going about things the kind of the normative way. I mean, he doesn't go and see a shrink. He doesn't, you know, he has this engagement with a lawyer. Any of the, the kind of the normal facilities that you might attend if you were going through this kind of event is not valid for this person. So he has to kind of go about it in his sort of weird, gimpy, do-it-yourself kind of way. And, uh, and that's where it becomes interesting because it begins to uh, address things that I'm interested in as an artist, you know, the, the kind of the dream of the historical avant-garde to meld uh, life and art to create this kind of uh, idealized state where there is not, you know, the art is sort of peeled away from the screen and taken out of the white box or the black cube and whatnot, um, and uh, begins to affect, you know, begins to inhabit the, the sort of your, your own very spatial sort of temporal kind of uh, uh, place. and. Um, you know, but but it, it, we knew that it was going to be a, cyc a cyclical story, and so we had to have we had to bring some of the, the 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 remainder, literally the kind of the little pieces that are left behind. And I thought that this boy would be uh, a device because when you're watching the film at the beginning, you really think, okay, well that's him, that's his childhood. It's going to be this kind of story where there's going to be some kind of childhood trauma, and instead of you know it's a kind of three card Monty. I mean, instead of you know, funneling you back into the, the past, it, it sort of pulls you along into the future until you're literally tightly packed in this, you know, sort of vacuum sealed space with a protagonist, and then you have to make sense of this weird, loopy 
uh, sort of temporal, uh, I guess, puzzle riddle that he's kind of caught in uh, with him. And so his actions then begin to make more sense or less, I don't know, uh, in retrospect, uh, when you remove those kinds of uh, explanations, you know, it wasn't a, a childhood trauma, it's not a child, it's not him, and so on. I guess just one last comment or observation before I open it up to the audience. In, in the final sequence, um, when he becomes a participant in the bank robbery and that moment of exchange of the coin happens with the boy, I had the sense watching it tonight that, that what we were seeing was a kind of a reintegration of the character into life after 90 minutes of um, trying to stage life. He becomes a participant, he reintegrates himself, um, and then I don't know where that gets us when it, when it comes to this loop. In another kind of movie, he would have walked off into the sunset and been you know, happy and gone on with his life, but instead you have him pessimistically trapped in this kind of uh, loop. I, I, my reading of the very end is, it, is not a pessimistic one. I think this is a, the, the very last scene when he kind of pauses for breath. It's the only time in the movie where he actually has this moment where he's able to stop and take stock in a way and have a glimpse of understanding. And this is what I was trying to do. And I, I consider myself a portraitist. And uh, if there's a portrait of, of this person, then it's a person who's experiencing grace in the briefest of you know, possible moments. It literally happens in the few seconds that he's given, that he's granted, uh, after all the, you know, all the nonsense and all the craziness and all this kind of uh, energy that he expends and all the capital and all the sort of gentrification that he, um, you know, is uh, under, um, undergoes uh, in, in uh, various spaces in London, moving people out, bringing new people in, moving resources in, bringing capital into play. Um, he tries all that, he goes through all these different renditions and then at the end, uh, it literally is about this kind of moment where he, he stops, it's, it's paused, it's okay, There's, he's not looking outside anymore, he's looking inside and he's able to have a moment to reflect and that's when you, of course, hear his voice and you hear that sort of um, a kind of arcane sort of uh, a statement that he has to say, but it, it is, for me, a portrait of grace. Um, and I'm not a sort of romantic uh, person, but it's as much as I've allowed myself, in a way, to, to go out something that's more ineffable, you know, something that is not about social relations and it's not about uh, trauma and its consequences, but it literally is about something that is not, it's beyond um, description in a way, and it's, it's, it's more emotive, I suppose. But of course, he has got a mask on, so he closes his eyes and he's not able to relish in the grace. He doesn't do the stuff that he does in the book, um, holding out his hands and sort of receiving the stigmata or the tingle or uh, whatever. Um, he just pauses. Questions out there? The question was about the role of humor in Omar's work in this film and uh, in his uh, uh, artwork. I don't have a lot to say about it. It's dry and dark, I suppose. Uh, um, you know, th th there are a few moments in the film that lend themselves to that in the story, uh, in the book, and it comes out of this notion of repetition, I suppose, and that's, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the, the fundamentals of, of slapstick, I think, and if you think about Buster Keaton and whatnot, it's this kind of, it's, it's very physical comedy, and so when we got into the bank and we got into our gimpy little set of the bank and we had like two and a half hours to shoot a scene because uh, after two and a half hours, the builders will come and start painting or start, you know, adding stuff or taking away stuff in order to make it the next. The only space that you have there, literally, is to create this kind of pratfall uh, and to create this 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 notion that these characters, as much as they're trying to, you know, go at efficiency in this kind of like hyper modern sort of capitalist way. Yeah, we're going to rob a bank and we're going to be so good about it and we're going to do it under four minutes and blah blah blah. Uh, what you have instead is the body rebelling. And that's always been something that's been of interest to me. I made a piece called The Casting in which instead of having people act out scenes, they actually freeze in, in tableaus. And what made that piece interesting is the fact that you you begin to watch the body for its ticks, for its little sort of shaking shakiness, for its being alive despite the order to freeze. And this notion of a tension between a director an authority saying, do this, freeze, or do that, rob a bank, and the body kind of resisting and falling apart 
and disobeying is, is a source of tension and possibly a source of comedy. Were people laughing? I wasn't here, but... Uh, yeah, yeah people were, were laughing, but maybe not at that, those parts. Okay, good. <laughs> um, try and repeat the question. Um, in in uh, Omar's earlier work, there's a kind of a, a, a form of acting, non-acting, that, that, that's, I guess, more distanced. Here, the acting, not acting, is something that we're supposed to really be um, on board with and, and really um, uh, ex uh, buy into, I suppose. I mean, I think the, the story is quite complex anyway. Do you know, it was quite complicated, and so there was this very, you know, there was a, a kind of an imperative, I suppose, to rein things in. And as much as I'm interested in creating this notion of artifice in storytelling and to create these, like, uh, Verfremdungseffekte, these alienation effects and whatnot, um, to go for the Brechtian sort of pauses and uh, whatnot, I think, you know, we wanted to tell a story in 90 some odd minutes. We had a difficult novel and we tried to sort of digest it in, 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 in big bits and not to begin to kind of obsess over the little parts and, and, and lose a, a sense of perspective. Uh, I think it's a fair point to make, but I think in the art, I'm constantly obsessing over this kind of stuff and this was in a way a respite. You know, We knew that we were making a drama um, and you know, with Tom Sturridge, who uh, was lovely, really, to work with. It was just about just kind of reining him in and, and not going for the kind of the, the symptomatic, you know, method-based kind of approach, but trying to get as blank as possible. Um, and before doing the film, I had asked him to watch Pickpocket, which he hadn't seen. And this was a very big, big, uh, hugely important reference for me because I think in both cases, um, of course, Pickpocket is massive. Um, we're talking about protagonists who are, uh, have a very oblique relationship to, to, to society and to their fellow sort of humans. And both of them are trying and are struggling to find their place in the world by literally going for the physical gesture and this notion of repetition. And there's this lovely moment in Pickpocket where he attaches the, the watch to the table. He's unable to deal with people, so he deals with objects, he deals with furniture, and he begins to develop a tactile sense, this notion of repetition touching, repetition touching, and it becomes an extremely charged and intimate moment, and it's a moment that he has to repeat over and over until he's ready to actually do it in situ, on the train, uh, with his fellow passengers. And, um, you know, and, and Tom and I talked about you know, this notion of repetition and this notion of intimacy and, and how you begin to create this kind of very theatrical, repetitive notion, a, a kind of a model f for the world and what happens when you finally take the skills that you sort of hone at home as, a, as, as this kind of gimp, as this freak uh, who attaches watches to furniture or does these kinds of things that he does and what happens when you sort of literally kind of implode it into the real and, and that's, that's what the project was about. I don't know how I got into a pickpocket, but that, that was, the, that was the, 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 the kind of the main reference. Well, Pickpocket is another film that ends with a, um, a moment of grace. Yes, so. but religious. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? At, the cer at a certain point in the film, the character starts to become effectively a kind of a director. Uh, and, and I have to say, I wondered if in a certain way you were doing a, a playful self-portrait sort of an ironic self-portrait, but your question, your point was um, that at the start of the film, the protagonist signs a contract that he won't, um, he won't talk about what happened or, or, or make a, a, any recording of what's happened to him. Um, and so is the film, in a sense, a kind of a breaking of that contract? I don't think he's breaking the contract. I think he's just moved away from that kind of legalistic space. I mean, his engagement with the law is extremely brief and he's extremely disinterested. I mean, he meets with a lawyer. He understands that he's gonna get this money. He doesn't understand what the money means and the money becomes uh, a means in a sense to an end. And he becomes unwittingly, I think in this sense, very much a kind of a director, uh, maybe a more sort of old school sort of theatrical director because he puts on a spectacle uh, that he consumes himself, uh, and then he decides to take that spectacle and to literally, um, you know, uh, transfer it into into a, a, a real space and, and a non sort of performative uh, space, you know, which we 
would think of as theater or cinema or, uh, or art. Um, and he also becomes unwittingly a kind of a, a gentrifier. I mean, he, he, he brings that money uh, without thinking so much about what the consequences are uh, into a neighborhood. He has to move the people who live in the building that he buys, he has to move them out, and it's not incidental that you know the camera shows you very briefly who these people are, and he brings other people in, he brings his own sort of fantasies into space, and he begins to map them on that space, and creates a, a kind of an alternative sort of reality in a space that was otherwise uh, perfectly functional um, in a way. So there are a couple of roles, I think, that he inhabits, director, gentrifier, investor, uh, robber, criminal, um, psychopath, um, victim. Um, and he kind of, he, he tries them all on, but he's, uh, I think in the end, he, he, he sort of elides, he elides that. I mean, I'm hoping that he elides those kinds of easy definitions and he's not there, uh, you know, he's not there crucified on some kind of weird cross and he's also not, um, you know, he's, he's not identified with any of these means. He, he kind of begins to have a much more weirder sort of insular sort of reflection at the end, I think. Yes. Yeah, so um, so the question is about um, the kind of the role of ethics and morality in the film in the sense that we're, we're given a character who we're supposed to um, sympathize with because of his predicament, because of uh, the, uh, his ordeal, but then he enacts a series of, he commits a series of acts that, you know, uh, uh, make us recoil. And, um, uh, and, and there is a kind of an ethical problem, the, the, a series of ethical problems with the character. In, in the process of building, in the process of creating this character, were you interested in, in exploring the, his, his ethical position? Um. I, I was interested in as much as I thought that people would bring a kind of an ethical sort of a judgment, you know, to bear on whatever it is that he's doing. But I think what he does is, again, he elides, uh, I think, in a sense, this, this sort of ethical uh, judgment, or rather he kind of slips into an aesthetic space instead. And this kind of, this notion that eth uh, aesthetics are uh, a substitute for ethics is it's hugely problematic. And historically, it's... Uh, it's been proven that way, but I think he he is for me very much a model of that sort of approach. I mean, he's not, a, you know, he has this moment of reflection at the end, but up until that point, he's a completely he's not reflective, you know. And I think in order to have an ethical sort of perspective, you need to have some sense of you know some sense of awareness. I mean, he's extremely aware of uh, whatever the drives, whatever fantasies, whatever wishes he wants to enact and fulfill in real space but they actually have a way of um, uh, being realized along aesthetic sort of parameters rather than ethical ones. I mean, he has absolutely no scruples uh, along the way, and that's, that's, that's sort of obvious. And that's, that's another characteristic of the kind of archetypal director who gets whatever he wants, uh, whatever the price other people have to pay. Yeah. I, I'm not that person, by the way. Were the loose ends, such as the, the the two cops pursuing the suitcase, and the um, and there were some other uh, uh, the possible relationship between um, the main character and and his friend who works at the law firm, um, were these loose ends kind of intentional, or were they just sloppiness? Um, I will be. Uh, I will take. Um, uh, role of defending sloppiness uh, in this very highly esteemed uh, uh, venue here. Uh, in this high temple of culture, I will be a small sort of uh, you know, advocate for sloppiness. I'm not interested in stories that are so hermetically sort of wrapped that you, know, you come away uh, with a little nugget uh, that you can put in your pocket and you know, maybe put on your desk and look at it every once in a while. I mean, I'm, I am interested, as I said before, in symptoms and in masks, and I think uh, these are things that are inevitab inevitably uh, slippery. And I think that in creating a portrait of somebody who's been through a traumatic event and a traumatic brain injury and uh, who has sort of memory issues and has ethical issues and whatnot, uh, I was careful not to uh, create a situation, I think, where we know a lot more than he does. I think that would be a kind of a, uh, for me, a weird sort of dimension. And so if that is rationalizing sloppiness, then, then let it be. Um, 
but you know, I thought that it would be interesting to have the world appear as kind of uh, multivalent and ambiguous to this uh, uh, character as it does to us. And so people have different guises when they appear to him and they can appear to be uh, friend and foe or, or a paramour uh, or somebody who's much more a mercenary or cynical vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, you know, this, 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 uh, this character. And the way that he deals with that ambiguities by recreating it, by reenacting it, by bringing into kind of controlled circumstances into the lab, as it were, at home. And so, for example, Catherine, who in the book disappears around page 30, I think, um, you know, there was some reasons for expanding um, her character, uh, good and bad ones. Uh, but what's interesting to me eventually is that he actually takes this character who's extremely sort of messy, possibly sloppily sort of created, and he tries to fix her with a little pin, uh, you know, really tries to nail it down, what it is that that essence of that moment in between them was about. And of course for him it becomes a very frustrating exercise because life is sloppy, you know, it doesn't, doesn't you know, it doesn't pin down in that kind of uh, narrow way. And um, it sort of impels him to, to, to continue and to try to expand his efforts to, to recreate things. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah. And time for maybe a couple more questions. Uh, yeah. Sorry, what was it? That has, the, has Tom McCarthy seen the film? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. And, and what does he think of it? He loves it. <laughs> Tom and I are very good friends. Uh, we holiday together. So, uh, yeah, no, he's, he's, um, he's seen the film, yeah. He saw it in London. He's not here. I mean, I think the, f the film is... While they share a kind of a, a, a core, the film is so different from the book that it doesn't threaten the book in any way. I mean, they're, they're, they're like two versions of an idea um, that have a certain amount of overlap, but there's, n there's no way in which I felt the film was competing with the book. There's no way in which the book was somehow being... I mean, they say that when, uh, when, when the screenwriters adapt books, they have to be absolutely ruthless and forget about the author and just do what's best for the film. And maybe that maybe that's applicable here, um, but it's a really for me a really uh, unusually successful adaptation of a book that does doesn't worry about doing justice to the book, but the book you know remains survives as a uh, the experience. Well, I think at any point in time, I at least have several different versions of Remainder running through my head. And this is one of them, and this is the one that's actually uh, become a, a, a two-dimensional sort of apparition. But um, I think to really do justice to the book is to actually go into a much more um, experimental mode and much more a meta mode uh, and to make the sort of the 18-hour-long sort of uh, romp where you have characters just kind of in very slow motion um, looking at coffee stains as we were in Stockholm, looking at blank walls. Uh, engaging with material, engaging with time and space in a much more abstract sense. And that would have been a beautiful project, but it would never have gotten the funding that uh, we needed to get. And so, you know, like anything, this is very much, I think this, this, this piece uh, uh, very much is a collaborative effort. Um, and, it's, it, and it's not, you know, I, I, I make works as an artist and I, I do have a sense of what that other sort of reality is like, and I don't have, as many pressures on me as an artist to, to make a story and to kind of put it into a particular box with a particular duration in a way to, you know, address an audience so that the audience is so-called, uh, uh, you know, captivated or sympathizing and whatnot. Um, but this was not this project. I mean, this project was very much from, from the start about uh, entering a kind of a, a mainstream space, bringing the novel into a more mainstream uh, area and we, we we didn't you know we we weren't and we weren't able to to make that kind of the the other the alternative sort of much more open-ended crazy versions of remainder we have time for one last question i think if there is a last question wave if you've got a question <laughs> hands pointing you see okay yes oh. you see it to wave 
So, I in other words, the experience of making this feature film involved working with a lot of collaborators. I I'm sure that you work with collaborators on your videos, but probably not on the same scale with the same vast army of people that, that are involved in making a feature film. So, uh, what was that experience like for you? How did you adapt to that? I mean, the, the, it's not it's not a, an issue of size. I think in in um, in the it's more an issue of duration, so the kind of scale is familiar. It's more the duration, it's an engagement. I mean, I usually shoot my projects in five, six, seven days, and it's a kind of, it's more of a one night stand or a five night stand, and, and this is a 34 night stand, and it takes a couple of years, and so the engagement is much more durational, it's a lot longer. Um, and then as you, as you sort of suggest, um, in the in the arts, the curators or whoever comes at you with the money, you know, they come at you with smaller sums, but they give you the money. They drop it on your doorstep, as it were, and they they just kind of, you know, disappear. And and um, and they don't do a lot of quality control. And and I'm not I don't mean this cynically, but it's uh, um, it's lovely. It's great. It's irresponsible. It's uh, playing around with in Europe public money and here with uh, something else. Um, and, and that fosters, you know, experimentation and it fosters a lot of navel gazing. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the model is more successful, but it's one that I'm very comfortable with. And this, this, this other model that I became more familiar with as a result of working on this film is not that. It's uh, people extremely um, invested in, from the start, in developing a script together. Uh, and having a lot of input on that script and, and, and sort of questioning a lot of things. And it, you know, I can't characterize it as, as good or bad. It's just, it, it, for me, they're just different economies. And uh, it's different relationship to capital. Um, and I only know independent filmmaking from this instance. I have much more experience in the arts, so, um, you know. Does it give you an appetite to, to come back to feature films? Well, it's, ex it's extremely seductive. I mean, uh, the difference in scale vis-a-vis -vis sort of capital and, 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 and time, you know, the fact that you can actually create this little world and, and slip into it and disappear into it is extremely seductive to somebody who, who deals with, you know, uh, realizing, making, making images or making realities out of ideas. I mean, that's, it's the most seductive thing about it. And so I think in order to preserve sanity, I think um, having the art world is, is wonderful. And then occasionally, in order to kind of uh, slip into the abyss or in, into, into some kind of, uh, into the muck, then, then you, can, you, know, you can have this, and that would be the most privileged thing. So, so the occasional course. foray, maybe, in the future into, into movies. Yes. Okay, uh, Omar Fast, thank, thank you. you very much.